Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Insider, brought to you, as ever, by Vanishing Inc. My guest today is a magician, a consultant, an author, a historian, a scientific sceptic, Jamie Ian Swiss. Jamie, welcome back to the show. How are you today? A pleasure to be back, sir. Thank you very much. Now, you were on the show before. We recorded live at Magi Fest talking about magic. But today we're going to be talking about scepticism to celebrate the launch of your most recent astonishing essay, The Conjurer's Conundrum, which is really a personal account of your own journey into scepticism. Part personal, part uh, historical. The book is is, uh, half and half. It's the first half is sort of the history of the interconnection between magic and skepticism, Mm -hmm. critical thinking, uh, rational inquiry. And then the second half is my personal history. Let's talk about how and why you became a skeptic. Oh, boy. Uh, The book... uh, all but almost begins uh, right after the prologue story uh, with a story <clears throat> of an experience I had at the World's Fair, at the New York World's Fair, when I was about 11 years old. And I uh, was in a really spectacular, futuristic exhibit uh, of the IBM. And I came upon a thing that claimed to do computerized handwriting analysis. I signed my name on a punch card. If anybody remembers what punch cards are, it's mm-hmm. how we used to talk to computers. And uh, I put in my dollar, which was two weeks' uh, allowance, and I got back, uh, after a lot of whirring and dinging and movement and things, a, a stack of like ten, eight or ten punch cards, each of which had a personality quality uh, that seemed reasonably accurate uh, printed at the top. But it, uh, the thing that bugged me about it, I was not a computer expert, but um, I thought... I knew that the punches were there for the computer to read. So if the computer needed the punches to read, how could it read my signature? This bugged mm-hmm. me. And then uh, my school uh, took us on a little trip not long after to a big comu- computer facility, uh, which was, you know, in those days, huge, frigid rooms of gigantic machines. And uh, we walked into one room, and I, and I spotted this machine that looked to me just like the computer at the IBM. Uh, whereupon the guide started to say, uh, now this, uh, boys and girls, is not a computer. This is a machine that just sorts cards. And I went, wait a minute. And I then, so I went home and I insisted to my parents that the next trip to the World's Fair, we would have to go back to the IBM exhibit, which they really did not like because you had to wait like hours online to get into these exhibits. But I was insistent. And um, I was a big fan uh, by that, even by that age, I'd already been, I started magic when I was seven. So I'd already been doing magic for a few years. The time I was 11, I usually had a trick in my pocket. And um, I had read, I've been reading about Houdini since I was nine or 10 or, or so. And I was a big fan at that time. I wasn't really taken so much with the escapes. I was really taken with the idea that he was uh, exposing fraudulent psychics. That was really interesting to me. Um, I didn't make the connection at the time, certainly, but when we went back to the fair, I just couldn't wait until I got to this. I went straight for this machine, and it was even more confusing because that was the year that IBM, elsewhere in the exhibit, presented optical character recognition that if you wrote, you hand wrote a, a date, it would come up with a newspaper front page of the New York Times from that date. So that was made it all more confusing seemed make it made it seem almost possible Mm -hmm. and uh i went back to the machine and sure enough it was the card sorting machine and i was really ticked off that i had been scammed by ibm two weeks of your allowance my allowance yeah but i also felt kind of satisfied that i had i had busted this mystery i had busted this fraud not just a mystery i had busted this fraud now i didn't grasp the weightiness of that at the time, the significance of that at the time. But many years later, as I became increasingly involved with skepticism uh, and with great skeptics around the world and that, and that tradition, uh, it occurred to me in thinking back that not only was there a connection between my skepticism and magic, as there has historically been for centuries, but there was also this personal skepticism partly informed by magic, partly informed by Houdini, and, and connected with my interest in science. If I hadn't, you know, at one time I, I pursued going into the sciences 
as well, so uh, before changing paths. So that was an early indicator. Why? Do, why did you back. want to go? Why did you want to go back? Had you realized that it was a scam? Because I was ticked off, really. Because I was ticked off. Because I, I was. It felt like I had been scammed. So you wanted to see the trick again. You were going up to the yeah, magician wanted, and say, well, "Do it I again." I wasn't a hundred percent certain because right. you know I had seen this machine. Then I, when I saw the machine at the computer facility, I locked in a really clear image of it. But I needed to go back one more time to see if I was. I suspected it was the same, but I wasn't uh, absolutely confident of my memory. Sure, sure. Um, in the essay, you obviously touch upon Scott and the discovery of witchcraft. Um, Scott didn't go as far as to say that witches don't exist, but what did he do in that book that resonated with you? Yeah, so uh, early in the book, um, right after the fair story, I think, I discuss... Uh, the Discovery of Witchcraft by Reginald Scott, published in 1584. Many magicians know about this book. Many magicians know that its little 22-page section of magic tricks in a book that was not about magic, uh, not intended to be about magic, uh, kicked off, was reused, copied, reused, plagiarized for the next century in some of the most important books written about magic of that era. Uh, in the in the 1600s, the discovery of witchcraft is an important book in many respects. It's an important book to historians of the Elizabethan era literature. It's an important book because it reflects a kind of rational, uh, free thought at the of the time, uh, because it re it reflected a skeptical position of the witch burnings of the time in Britain, and uh, for other reasons as well, we, we have pretty strong circumstantial evidence that uh, Shakespeare probably drew on discovery in his research uh, when he wrote repeatedly in many plays about witches, obviously, in, in Macbeth, but also about ghosts and spirits and things like this. Mm. He probably read Scott. So uh, Scott's discovery, and it should be made... Uh, clear that discovery, spelled with an I-E in the old English sense, the meaning really was explication of. Scott's discovery of witchcraft, the explanation, if you will, examination, explication of witchcraft. And so as you rightly point out, Scott was a creature of his times, even though a very progressive one. He belonged to this kind of free thought Protestant offshoot of the church. And... Um, but I consider, some would dispute this, but I consider Scott's discovery to be a significant early work of skepticism. And the reason I say that is because the skeptic movement, such as it is uh, in the modern sense, since we can date it, let's say, from uh, the creation of PSYCOP, the Committee for mm -hmm. the uh, Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, uh, 50 years ago, whatever, um, the scientific skepticism movement has always concerned itself with testable claims and the nature of evidence. So sure. we're talking about truth, but we're talking about truth in a particular sense. We're talking about testable truth mm -hmm. and evidence for truth, and therefore how we define quality of evidence and how we define the nature of truth in this context. Not all truth, not all evidence. A mistake that many skeptics often make is they think that people who believe in the paranormal lack evidence for their beliefs. That is rarely, if ever, true. Okay. Uh, people who believe in the paranormal uh, and other supernatural claims always have evidence. But by scientific uh, <laughs> definition, it's lousy evidence. Right. And so the dispute occurs in the definition of what constitutes evidence, right? Sure. Um, conspiracy theorists don't, don't to themselves act in an absence of evidence, even though most conspiracy theories actually are built on the evidence of, in the gaps, right? Mm -hmm. The lack of evidence. So it's almost an extreme example. But they believe they have evidence. They tie things together. So the point about Scott is that Scott, even though, as you say, he does not deny the possibility of witches, but what he's denying, what he's questioning, actually, 
is the caliber of evidence that was being used at the time to convict witches. And he was saying, I don't think this evidence is good enough. Right. And so because he's focused on the evidence, skepticism and the scientific worldview is not about telling you what to believe. What we believe, what we who possess a, who, who try to follow a scientific worldview believe at any given moment is always subject to change in a scientific worldview. It's always subject to revision and improvement. It is, the scientific worldview is self-correcting. The scientific method is self-correcting. Religious sure. worldviews are not. They lock themselves in 2,000 years ago or wherever the, whenever the case may be, and then nothing ever changes, right? Um, and so uh, the, the, the point is, is, is that we are interested as skeptics in the nature of evidence, and so was Scott. Skeptics are not interested in telling you what to believe. We're trying to talk about how to think, not what to think, but how to think. Not about the conclusions, because science is always changing and adding to its conclusions. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, that's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> um, but how we go about thinking about that, that's the nature of the scientific worldview and the scientific method. And that's what Scott was doing. Scott was examining the evidence. I, I always think, you know, if you filter through the old English, which is a little challenging, but if you filter through the old English, to me, Scott reflects a very contemporary mind. Uh, we don't know for sure. We know that there was a, another magician, a French magician, Cotatus, who helped him create that chapter. But, you know, with Scott using magic tricks as evidence for how smart people can be fooled, that's mm -hmm. basically what the chapter was for, um, you cannot help but suspect that Scott was a bit of an amateur magician that had an interest in magic. It's not unusual, right? We, yeah, we, yeah. In the scientific world, I find, we find this all the time. Uh, and so in PSYCOP, when it was created, all, most of the key members of the board of PSYCOP, from James Randi to uh, Martin Gardner, Ray Hyman, uh, these were all people with strong magic backgrounds, yeah, all yeah, of yeah. them, you know. And so um, it's not hard to imagine that Scott had a bit of a personal interest in magic as well. Um, and again, the bottom line for me is, Scott's discovery is a work of skepticism because it is really about questioning the evidence. It's interesting you mentioned Hyman and, and uh, the other magicians that you said then because the next question that I actually had was why do you think so many skeptics are magicians or at least people with a background in magic? Well, we know certainly, let's not over um, extend the conclusion. Uh, we know there are Oh, there are certainly people in magic who are not aligned with the scientific worldview. Yeah. We know there are people in conjuring. There's a subset of magicians who are involved in New Age theosophy and the magic of crystals or whatever else goes with that worldview. We know that there is an overlap there. Um, and I don't necessarily mean, for example, bizarre magic because... In fact, uh, although bizarre magic em embraces those things on a uh, presentational viewpoint, it doesn't necessarily reflect that worldview of the performer at all. Mm -hmm. um, I knew, I knew uh, uh, Masculine Mage, Tony Andrusi, and I, I, wouldn't, I, I think Tony Andrusi was a pretty rational guy, believe me. Um, and uh, so... Um, but to your, to your question, having acknowledged that, I think that magic teaches you at a very early age some very important lessons about worldview. I think magic teaches you at a very early age that what you see should not necessarily be believed. That is a very powerful lesson. Yeah. Because the lesson of science and the scientific worldview is that you need to set aside your personal experience. Your personal experience is not good evidence. Mm -hmm. And that the evidence of a scientific experiment properly conducted needs to actually take place uh, over your personal impressions. Now, I gladly embrace that. 
I absolutely embrace that in how I think about the world. But many people find that offensive, if not downright idiotic. Uh, and that's because of ego. Right. Right. That's because humans have egos. So, you know, my friend Danny Hillis, who's a world famous computer uh, scientist, uh, when his, he had a uh, magic tutor come and teach his kids, give his kids lessons when they were adolescents. Not because he had any intention of any of them becoming magicians, but just because he thought it was part of a valuable education. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And uh, Werner Herzog, the great filmmaker, who I'm pleased to know a bit, um, has talked repeatedly about in his idealized film school, because he mostly hates the idea of film schools, but he has an idea about his own film school that's quite different, where you know everyone's issued a set of bolt cutters, for example. <laughs> um, uh, you know, he talks about teaching magic uh, as a way, as a, as partly as a, a way of generating ideas for for filmmakers who deal in illusion, but in a, in, a, in other respects too, what it teaches you. Um, about thinking, about how to think. So I, I think that's a very powerful lesson. You know, I've walked every one of my kids through my three boys through the carnival. By the time they were 10, we've walked through the midway. And I've shown them how every crooked game works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a good lesson. Yeah, yeah. It's a really good lesson. Yeah. And it's also a really good lesson to teach people... Um, to not so harshly judge why people come to the wrong conclusions. To have some insight and understanding as to how human brains are wired to make, unfortunately, to make those mistakes. Yeah, yeah. At the Genie Bash, Yuri Geller gave a talk. It was a yeah. full house. A lot of magicians came out being very inspired and blown away by how lovely a, he was. And It was not only a full house, it was a standing ovation. Yeah, so why, why does that happen? And it was not only a standing ovation... I was in the room. Mm. So was I. I was in the room. Um, I, I did not stand for the ovation. Um, uh, I forget the attribution on this. Was it? Was it? Was it? It might have been Abraham Lincoln, uh, but I could be wrong. Who said, "You know, you can fool some of the people some of the time, and uh, some of the people all of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time." In that room. I saw a, one of the most dramatic demonstrations of the fact that you can't fool some of the people all the time. And the reason is, is because Geller, um, Geller's talk, so Geller is, you know, he's always repackaged himself. Mm -hmm. He's a survivor. He's always repackaged himself for whatever he can sell. And at that time, he was trying to sell the idea to magicians that he had come clean and he was no longer making these claims. Uh, and that would, now the purpose of him implying that, of course, was to gain an audience and to get himself booked at magic conventions as a, as a speaker. Um, magic conventions and elsewhere, although I don't think he's been very successful elsewhere. Uh, and so it, was, it served his purpose to imply that. Mm -hmm. But you cannot find, for all the magicians who are quick to tell me, oh no, but he doesn't claim that anymore. I just had this exchange on, on Facebook with a, a friend a, few, a week ago. Uh, you cannot find a quote in which he actually says that because he won't say it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because he's a sociopath and a con man. That, that's what he does. That's what he is. That's how he spent his life. He's probably never told the truth to anyone other than Shippy Shrang. Uh, and you have to be a kind of, that's a pretty dark way to live. Um, but no one else has ever come forward. And they say you can't keep a secret, you know, three can't keep a secret unless two are dead. So, and there's truth to that. So it's likely he's never told the truth to anyone except Shippy Strang, who was his uh, assistant. Yes. Um, and so that talk, I saw that talk. I, I watched it, I believe, objectively. Uh, and that talk was a was a hour and change, or however long it was, press kit. It was just a press kit, famous, you know, fam 
famous people, famous places, all, all my successes, I made money at this, I was successful at this, I was successful at that. It was just an hour or more of braggadocio. But the telling parts of that braggadocio were that the only tools or ideas that he expressed to the audience, and he expressed these repeatedly, were do anything, say anything to be successful, and successful means rich and famous. Do anything, say anything. In an hour and a half or whatever it was, there was not once the slightest acknowledgement that actions have consequences or that actions have moral consequences. This was never acknowledged to the extent that it could be implied as acknowledged. He actually told the story, and this is the closest I think I ever saw him or read of him coming to an admission of sorts. Uh, remember, his general admission is, I, now is I'm, a, I'm an entertainer. Mm. But of course, there's no meaning in that. It doesn't pin you down. You know, sure. Amazing Kreskin, one man's opinion, Kreskin has spent his life saying, you know, I'm real. Everything I do is real. Oh. Well, that's, that's Orwellian newspeak. It's, <laughs> it's language designed to sound like words and be absent of meaning. Mm -hmm. But the one moment that stuck out for me was when he told the story, he showed photos of a photograph uh, that he had publicized at one time that was like hung up in a store or something somewhere, or an exhibit. It was a photograph of himself, and the claim was made it could be healing. And he told a story of a woman coming who had something seriously medically wrong with her, like MS or something like that. I think he actually acknowledged the detail and, you know, wanted to touch the photo and, and to be healed. And as Geller responded to this, uh, recounted this with great pride at how many people had responded and the crowds it drew and whatever, his response, his comment, if you will, after he gave us this particular account of this woman, was to turn to the group and say, come on! Come on! You're going to believe that? Come on! Well, that's the comment of a sociopath. That's a comment of a human being who lacks basic human empathy. And I had someone recently comment about the list of charities that are on, that are on uh, Geller's site. You don't think that could be for some purpose, do you? You think that was all motivated because he's such, he's such a humanitarian? Um, so this is as close as he comes. And the thing that appalled me uh, that day was the handful of people in the room who stood up and had their children stand with them. Because I thought, what do you think you're teaching your children about the world? That you want them to model themselves after a sociopath and a professional con artist. That you're going to go home and remind them that they should say anything and do anything to be rich and famous. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, that's not what I teach my kids. Um, so why, to go to your question, why do some magicians, some, and I would say it's a minority. I hope so. But, yeah. uh, the mo I would say that most of those numbers are mentalists. Right. And that's because of an old joke. The best answer to that is an old joke of Penn Jillette's. It used to be in the Penn and Teller show many, many years ago. He used to say uh, that some magicians look at Geller as, I will quote, a peer with work. A peer, P-E-E-R, with work, who's getting hired. 
And that's the extent of it. And there is no doubt that there is a stripe of mentalists who totally look at Geller and go, uh, yeah, Geller, Darren Brown, Banachek, I don't see a difference. They're all working. That's whatever it takes. Um, and so I, and I think also that at the Genie Convention, magic conventions are not, uh, are mostly attended by amateur magicians, mm -hmm. not professionals. And uh, celebrity has power. Right. There's the power of celebrity. Ooh, I'm in the same room with somebody who's been on TV. Sure. That's a thing for some people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think it's a combination of those things. Yeah, fair. Um, and I don't think it's particularly, you know, I, I would not call it commonplace among conjurers, not in my experience. But it is, it does represent, let's put it this way. Do 90% of the members of the PEA admire Geller? Oh, yeah, no doubt about it. But, you know, 